this is all your GPUs are belong to us. I am Ryan Hallisey, and this is Piotr Prakop. We work at NVIDIA, and we're going to be talking about how we maintain GeForce Now, the GeForce Now infrastructure. Okay, so if you don't know about uh, GeForce Now, if you're not familiar with it, um, a little intro to it. Um, what we do uh, at, at NVIDIA with GeForce Now, we have a, a service where we offer you to play games in the cloud, and we can stream it to your device. And so what, what, uh, how does this look with infrastructure? So we take GPUs, we put them in our data centers, and you as an end user can open up your device, you can go to the GeForce Now client, and open up your Steam library, start playing your game, and the graphics for that game will be will be rendered on a GPU in the cloud. And those graphics get streamed back over the network to your device. So that's a little bit how it works. Um, these these data centers, these these clusters, we um, our fleet is, is a bunch of it's all it's all Kubernetes or mostly Kubernetes. Uh, the one we're going to be talking about is uh, we have about 40 plus Kubernetes clusters that we run, which is about 30,000 plus nodes. It might even be more than that now. Um, and we run a lot of these workloads uh, in VMs. So we use Kubert a lot. Uh, and these, these workloads are uh, Windows guests. And we, um, so, it makes, so we run Windows guests, we attach GPUs to them, and you know, we, we render graphics and, and stream them to end users. And we're about 60,000 plus GPUs across our data centers uh, geolocated all over the world. Okay, um, so what's our philosophy when, when I say maintaining the fleet, like doing maintenance? What's our philosophy um, at NVIDIA? So I'm gonna give you an analogy. If, if you need two requirements if you wanted to build a race car, first requirement is you really wanna build a fast car, right? The second requirement is you need to be able to do re and repair your car on the racetrack. The second requirement is equally as important as the first. And so with Kubernetes in production, it's really important that we keep that in mind, that we run a really good service. We run a service that's always available for us and one that we can repair while it's, run, while it's in production. Okay, so what does that mean, like maintaining the fleet? Like what are all the steps, the things that we do when we want to maintain this infrastructure? Well, we do a ton of things. Um, we always want to make sure our GPUs are up to date, right? There's new GPUs that are coming out all the time, and we have, we want to get them in our data centers. We want to make them the best hardware available for our users. And so we're constantly taking GPUs and we're, we're, we're making them available in different ways, and, and so we want to get these, these GPUs and make them, uh, get them into our infrastructure. Uh, we're doing Kubernetes upgrade, right? There's lots of reasons to do Kubernetes upgrade, right? We, CVEs is, is obviously one that's really important, but I mean, features, right? We participate in the community. We build, you know, we, we build uh, on top of Kubernetes and we, we contribute to it. And there's so many features coming out that are so important, even nowadays we talk about DRA, so important with how we allocate devices and really influential with how we want to use Kubernetes. And then also, uh, really important new features like um, list streams, um, consistent cache reads, all this stuff like so important for scalability that we really care about. And, and we, so we need to get these new versions of Kubernetes, we need to get them into our data centers, we need to get them as soon as we can. So what else we do? Driver upgrades, um, such a critical thing like anyone who's got GPUs here, you're probably upgrading your drivers on a regular cadence. We do as well, we pay close attention to that. We wanna make sure we put a lot of effort in to make sure we have the latest drivers in our data centers. Um, we run on bare metal, so you know, running VMs on bare metal, so we do OS upgrade, right? We do every, which includes so many things. I mean, the package management to everything from the host config, um, all of those steps are all kind of rolled up together um, and it takes a lot of work. Um, if you BIOS upgrade, right? A lot of things, a lot of things that people do, right? We do, we do that as well. And then and remediation, right? So important, um, you know, we keep our our clusters healthy. And then the list kind of goes on. And actually, there's probably many more, but I can, can't talk too long about it. Okay, so we have this problem, right? We we want to maintain our fleet. Um, so we put our heads together, and we thought to ourselves, 
well, how do we do this? How, how can we how can we do this uh, with our existing requirements? Um, well, so I wrote down a few goals, like when we were thinking about this solution. Uh, first is, you know, we want um, we want to up, uh, upgrade our infrastructure without impacting users, right? It almost goes without being said, but it really does need to be emphasized. Like, we don't want to impact our users. Like, someone's playing a game, it's not cool that we, you know, we interfere with that. So we, we, we really emphasize that. Um, we want a scalable solution, right? We have so many data centers, so many nodes, so many GPUs. It's really important that um, we're achieving the right amount of scale when we're doing maintenance. Uh, and then we want to support any current and future infrastructure upgrades, right? This is like a casting a really wide net because we have no idea of all the different infrastructure upgrades and stuff that we want to do in the future. But the point is, like, we want to be agnostic. We want to be ready for anything that we might want to do. Uh, and lastly, we really, we really want to enable automation. It's so critical at our scale and, and all our operations that we have to do. Um, we really want to scale by automating more. Uh, and so when looking at trying to solve this problem, um, we also have a few non-goals. And I think um, these are also really important. We, we don't want to re-implement or replace kubectl drain. Um, I think it's like does a good job for what it, what it does. And people like it, right? And, and the second one is that um, we don't want to create an NVIDIA-only solution. And so the kind of the way I would summarize those two non-goals is like we want to use what the community does and does well, and we want to leverage that. And so if you're using a solution in the community, the whole point is like you would be able to keep using it too. Because that's how we'd feel. Like we like, you know, kubectl drain. We want to keep using it too. So the whole idea is we can leverage those things, and whatever solution we come up with, would be able, anyone would be able to leverage that too. Okay, so we we kind of put our heads together. We we took our requirements, and um, what we figured is that we needed some sort of uh, maintenance API. We figured that um, that the missing piece was that we needed a way to track maintenance, and and essentially this maintenance API would be. We need a bunch of states, and those states would describe a maintenance, right? And and so we can put that behind an API, right? A CRD in Kubernetes, we can extend the API. And um, our thesis is that if we can accurately define all of the different states that a maintenance would go through, um, then we should be able to create a bunch of powerful tooling around it. So we needed to test this thesis. So these were the the requirements we came up with, these are the different states that we ca that came to mind that we believe that every maintenance will go through in, in some form. Okay, so the first one, uh, scheduling a drain. All right, we're all familiar with this. This is like me saying, okay, I'm going to a node, and like, okay, it's time to evacuate. Like, you know, please leave the node. All right, we do this in lots of different ways, um, uh, but, you know, we that's always our first step when we want to get to that node and do maintenance on it. Uh, the second step, start the drain. And this is this can mean a lot of things. Like I said, kubectl drain is like that sounds good. A lot of people use it, but if you use it a lot, I'm sure there's some people who out there who know the corner cases of it. Especially if you have one replica and you have uh, and you can't scale down and you it, you'll get blocked <laughs> when you try to do kubectl drain, right? There's like all these concepts that um, come in that define a drain. And um, so you might need a different solution. And you know, so however you define drain, the whole point is is that what we want to do with this this state requirement is that you need to actually execute on, on the drain. You start it and, and you actually go and complete the drain. So essentially what that means is you can you can define essentially all the different tools and methods as you can do to get there. But you do need to get there will to a point where the node is drained. Right? We can't really do maintenance on something that has um, active workloads that defeats our, our purpose. Okay, so uh, the fourth requirement um, is actually starting the maintenance, right? This is where the, you know, the fun starts. So we get to a point now where we can actually take this node or take this, you know, this hardware, whatever it is we want to do um, and, and upgrade it or remediate it or fix it, whatever it is, without actually worrying about impacting end users. Um, and so, you know, this state you can imagine is very much up to the end user. It's going to be like there's so many different maintenances and different techniques you can use. Um, in our clusters, we use KubeSpray, like if we want to upgrade Kubernetes. But I mean, everyone uses different tools for 
upgrading Kubernetes. And then we also have very unique sets of hardware and topologies and, and upgrades and maintenances that we do. So again, it's like very much up to the end user to define exactly what that means, but you're always gonna have to do that step. And then next we have to complete a maintenance or um, have a fork in the road here and fail a maintenance, right? We need exit ramps when in these situations where um, things don't quite go the way we expect. Um, uh, and then you know, next we do validating a maintenance. This kind of thing, like think of, you know, we run tests, we wanna make sure that um, some assumptions are met uh, before um, we move on. And I think what's really important about that is you know, with validating, um, you can, it's really powerful to define what are your assumptions are when you complete your maintenance, right? Um, we do a lot of, um, uh, we make, with our testing, we test like the node is healthy before we return it to the cluster. But you could really do anything. You could say, okay, was this maintenance successful, right? Like in Kubernetes, that would be like looking at the node and seeing the, you know, the, the version that the, the kubelet is reporting on the API. Um, but there's like so many ways you can do that. So um, there's a lot of ways you can you can approach that, and and, and it's really valuable with uh, to make those assumptions. And so um, completing or failing a validation, what what's really interesting is that that fork, that other path where we fail validation. Like we could do a whole KubeCon talk on failing validation or, or, or getting a node that we can't bring back in production. Like I'm sure we've probably all seen this, like where we've we've got to a point where this node just fails and we don't know what to do. And you know, we've done all different things to try and bring it back and we've retried our maintenance operations, we've retried validation and we have no idea like what's wrong and, and someone like in the data center pulled out the ethernet cable or something. You know, like we, we have no idea, like it's hard to detect these things sometimes and um, and so what do we do? Like, what's really valuable is that these off ramps can bring into a place where you, it's almost like detection. Like we've, we've determined that this node can't work, right? We've, we've probably gone through this process like four times, fifth pass through or 10th pass through validation, it still fails. We should probably have a person look at it. So anyway, that's a whole talk that we could talk about. We have like so many cases where we come across these things, like these edge cases where we we, we, kind of, we basically bring in people to go look at and figure out what's going on with the node or the GPU or any other sort of accelerators. Okay, and then finally, returning to production. Um, finally, like, we're done. Like, this would be the last step. Like, we've completed our maintenance. We've validated the node's healthy. The, the maintenance was complete. So you can kind of get a sense, just to summarize, like, with these eight is the, these steps are going to be the steps you're always going to go through when you want to do maintenance uh, in some form. So uh, what did we do? We, we, like I said, we wanted to build an API. So what, what we did, um, well, we, we did that. We built an API. And uh, we, call it, we called it Notify Maintenance API. Uh, the, the, the name, Notify, um, combined with maintenance, kind of has a meaning in that we, we want to send out a lot of notifications with maintenance. Maintenance is kind of interesting in that like, everyone wants to know about it, right? It's really important. And so that's one of the other focuses that we have. Um, and I'll get to that in just a minute. Uh, but just to give you an example, like looking at the requirements that we had for doing maintenance, um, you can see like some of the states that you always will go through, like scheduling a drain, right? We just created a state for that. We call it maintenance schedule. Starting a drain, right? We created a state for that. Um, we call it maintenance started. Um, and then last one, like returning to production, right? That's maintenance complete. So you get a sense like we created this finite state machine, goes through a bunch of steps, and we have an, this these canonical, APIs, these canonical states for representing maintenance, we can do lots of powerful things with that. So that's what we're gonna, what we're gonna talk about in just a second. So this is just an example um, of what this looks like. It's actually a um, pretty simple API. We, um, not too much to it. Um, we have a few fields in the spec. Um, the addition of a message channel, this is kind of the notified part of notify maintenance where um, we wanna get the word out that, that uh, maintenance is going on and so, um, we actually send our messages um, as so like, well, for example, like this is a CRD, this is uh, a CR, and you have um, in it, uh, or with, with, with it, the Kubernetes events, right? If we change the state, we'll get all these different events sent to all the watchers. So we have all this event system built in Kubernetes. Um, with uh, our focus with, with actually notifying lots of people, we also want to send the events um, outside of that structure, right? Because like human beings, we don't really watch Kubernetes objects and like monitor their states. It's not really a great system. I mean, I know everyone loves you know kubectl watch, but 
Um, I don't like sitting in my laptop at 3 in the morning doing that. So I would much rather get some sort of notification in another way. And so that's what we do is like these additional ch message channels, we send them out, we send them to people, we'll send them to Slack. Um, they get all over the place. We actually use pub sub systems like SNS, and, um, but you can really use anything um, like RabbitMQ and eventually fan out these messages all over different, all over different places outside um, uh, of Kubernetes. Okay, in the second field, um, maintenance ID, essentially like you can see here, vBIOS 042B, like what does that mean? Um, well, kind of like what we want to do is we want to like version our upgrades. We want to describe our upgrades and, and what we're doing. And particularly, um, these should be like UIDs. So all the CRs associated with vBIOS 042B should all have the same maintenance ID. And they'll all have um, different CRs and different representations uh, of or description of maintenance. And so this one is vBIOS 042B, and it's on node 003B. Right, we could have another one that's on node 004B. Um, so these, these kinds of things are where we should see a lot of them. And then in the aggregate, it describes exactly what we're doing with maintenance inside of a, a, inside of a cluster. Um, and then another one, the maintenance type. This one's kind of cool because um, two types of maintenance is um, planned and unplanned. Um, I'll have a diagram with that in just a second. But really important field. Um, planned is like premeditated maintenance operations that you want to do. Um, unplanned is things that suddenly go wrong that need to be fixed. And um, that has a big deal for, for understanding whether actually uh, a maintenance should be scheduled or treated differently, right? Like unplanned maintenance, if something's wrong, we kind of want to fix the node versus planned, like maybe it's not a good time to accept this Kubernetes upgrade when the node's broken. So you kind of get a sense like how that, um, how that can, uh, we can use that. Um, and then uh, the last two in status, um, you know, we have the maintenance status. This is just our, our diff this is our representation of our state machine. Uh, and then the last one, um, SLA expires. Um, one thing that's really important with um, doing maintenance is, is that uh, you really have to have this agreement with the end user that if you want to remove a workload, it, it can't just run indefinitely. So we, we have to have some sort of agreement here and understanding that these workloads that should at some point expire. And so that's kind of a way to signal that we can have a, a timestamp to that we agree upon, you know, some later date that these workloads should be moved. Okay, so let's talk more about the notify part of this. So really what we're doing with this notify maintenance API is we're, we're trying to coordinate maintenance um, between operators, right? We write controllers, we write operators, we have a bunch of states, and we want to use those um, as a conduit to communicate, right? We have... Um, we can write a bunch of automation, we can uh, to, to do maintenance for us. But it's really important to include humans. Like I was saying, we want to get people involved. They really care about maintenances. And if there's like any DevOps people out there, like you know that when failures occur, like they end up as incidents. And those incidents get reported to your phone for over pager duty or something. And, and you probably want to figure out what's going on. And, and so a lot of times we want to actually, before you get that page, we probably would like to know that Okay, someone was actually doing maintenance in that zone. It's not really an incident, so it's really important to you know to get the, the word around about the stuff. And like I said, we we basically what we do is we we send these over to uh, SNS whenever we do these state transitions. Um, but, um, but you can you can use really any system, any message bus for this, and we fan out to all different sources, and then we we actually format our messages for different end users like humans. Um, we probably don't want like YAML, when we get a message, we probably would just like a string summarizing what's happening. Um, so we do stuff like that. Okay, so here's a look at what it actually, um, when this comes together. So this picture um, is a look at just inside a single cluster. Um, when you have the Notify Maintenance API, uh, what do you get? So with Notify Maintenance API, you have a bunch of states. We have this understanding of of the meaning of a maintenance that represented in state. and what we get is this, um, these orange boxes surrounding it. And these are the ecosystem that, that is really important for doing maintenance. And these kinds of things are really specific to end users. So um, we have our own implementations of these, of these things, and probably anyone that's doing maintenance would have their own implementation of this as well. So just give you um, a brief overview of what they are, like a maintenance schedule, a scheduler is a, um, a component that would move us between different states and notify maintenance, right? From like if we schedule the maintenance or if we're in drain state, 
you know, if the node's drained, we would move between these kinds of things. Um, and then we have another controller, like a, a drain controller, a drain operator, that understands the right way to drain, right? It could just be a kubectl drain, or, um, I mean, there's other kinds of complex things, like with kubevert, you may want to live migrate, right? So all these complex things that you could do, so that's where you'd want to implement that. And then um, the last one, the last orange box on the right side is the maintenance controller. That's essentially saying that um, we want a controller that actually actively does the maintenance. So that would be something like, like Kubernetes upgrade or upgrading the vBIOS. Whatever it is, like it upgrade the OS, anything. Like we can write, um, we can get to the state representation where we say, okay, it's time to do maintenance. The controller can spring into action and actually do the maintenance. Um, and then, and then the, the bottom picture is like how we kind of spray these uh, events around. Okay, so that's that's how it looks like today. That's something we implemented now in, in video clusters. So this is kind of what we want to move to tomorrow. Um, and this is like the large, kind of like the end game for us in coordinating fleet maintenance, um, is what I call it. And we're really what we're doing here is we're push, we're shifting the user left, where instead of just creating CRs inside of data center, inside of Kubernetes cluster, we actually want to. Um, look outside of the Kubernetes cluster. We want to, at the fleet level, we want to um, say, okay, I want to do a maintenance on a data center in New York City and a data center in Florida and a data center in Los Angeles. And I, and then this fleet scheduler component, this fleet maintenance component says, okay, it's a great time to do maintenance right now in Florida. So all we do is go into the zone and say, create a bunch of CRs and, 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 and then inside the zone, we have the scheduler component that's gonna see these and say, okay, it's a good time to do maintenance on node one, node seven, and node 10, right? And it would work through the zone. So we can, you kind of see how the hierarchy of this, um, you can build this, this, this hierarchical system. Um, and that's what we're actually looking to do, uh, to do now. Okay, um, so for, I'm gonna hand over to Piotr in, in just a second. The, um, Piotr is going to talk about unplanned maintenance. Um, this is going to be the like the real world use of like of this, or one of the big gains. We actually have quite a few, but unplanned maintenance is a really cool one. Um, unplanned maintenance is like I said, it's operations that go wrong in the in the data center, and um, we need to we need to fix them. We need to fix these nodes, and um, this is a big win for us that we were able to automate that process and work with notify maintenance to schedule these things safely, so that we can remediate and fix nodes. Hello. Uh, so at the beginning, I would like to uh, tell what I understand about unplanned maintenance. So in our case, can be anything like hardware failure, for example, GPU fail of the bus or software crashes, which sometimes is also a symptom of bad hardware. And the more GPUs you have in your data center, the more failures you have. And instead of fighting with it, we just accept that failures and we incorporate the ongoing maintenance like as a part of our daily operations. So uh, yeah, I want to uh, show you first how it looked in the past. So we have perfectly fine, healthy Kubernetes cluster with GPU nodes and something goes wrong. We can see that the capacity goes down. And in the past, uh, we just had to have some on-call engineer go into the node, diagnose it, go through our run books, the signature errors, everything, and when he uh, successfully, hopefully successfully diagnosed the issue, then he can remediate it, like run some commands on the node, also through run books, etc. And then when everything went fine, uh, he could return the node to the cluster. So it, take, uh, it took a lot of engineering hours for us to sustain this model, and some of the failures, we didn't even notice them, and it was like uh, permanently affecting our capacity. So we wanted to solve it somehow. And this is how we integrate with Notify Maintenance. We just took Ryan picture and removed the human on the left from it and run some automation. Basically, we have, a, I would say, three layers in that. First one, very important one, is the detection layer. So, uh, yeah. So currently, we use node condition as an API to show that the node failed. Uh, we use node condition because there is one cool open source project which is called Node Problem Detector, and it also uses this API. So we just uh, started with it. And you can see that it's kind of expressive API. You can see what's wrong with the cluster. 
uh, what's wrong with the node, but the longer we use it, we see some shortcomings. But it's like with every new Kubernetes project, you start building from the APIs that are present, that are there, and then when you start to add new features, you see that maybe it can be extended or maybe it can be replaced. So let's take an example of a hardware failure, yeah? We have like, for example, two GPUs on the node, and one failed. So how will we express that which GPU failed? Yeah. In our case, we just put it in the message field, and then we have some, some regex or other things in the other layers of our stack. But we could probably make it a bit better for uh, our operators. So maybe DRA can fix it in the future. I know you will hear a lot of DRA during this KubeCon. Yeah, but maybe. Maybe you can use it. So uh, we have... We, you know, we are not only using node problem detector as our detection demons, we also have our custom GPU problem detector, which is the part of our device plugin. So it's like, uh, for us, it's the perfect place to put this detection as it has all the power uh, for the GPU, it has all the knowledge about it, so it can uh, very quickly and precisely says what's going on and so on, so what's wrong with the GPU on the node. So. Yeah, uh, when we have the detection and we say that node failed, then we use another cool open source project which is called Node Health Check Operator. And basically it has its own config and it like compares the uh, node condition on the host with uh, its config and when it sees that, okay, I know this node condition and it means that the node is broken, it triggers uh, specified remediation. And triggering remediation is just creating another Kubernetes custom resource so another operator can take it and fix it. So as you will see in like two slides, uh, our remediation engine is also like escalating uh, remediation. So is, if the first one failed, then go to the second one. If the second one failed, go to the third one, so on, so on, so on, until we say, okay, it's unfixable, someone has to manually do it because the machine is yeah, cannot do it. So uh, this is the uh, custom resource that we use. Uh, it's it's called Node Health Check, and you can see that for for the selector match expression, uh, we tell Node Health Check operator take a look at all the GPU nodes, uh, make sure that they are not currently being uh, uh, the the other maintenance control is not acting upon it. Like for example, someone is uh, upgrading Kubernetes on it. Etc. And when you see that the GPU DVP device failure node condition on the node for two minutes, create node remediation template object. And the node remediation template object uh, will just uh, instruct our operator to run those remediation on the host. And as you can see, uh, this is like an escalating one, our remediation engine. So for example, let's take an example, GPU fell off the bus, uh, fell off the bus. So in, in the peak times, we only care about the capacity, so the simplest solution is just to reboot the node. Maybe it will help, maybe not. Uh, but definitely we'll have more nodes in the cluster for our customers. And then sometimes it happens that reboot is stuck, so maybe we should uh, re like escalate it. Then, for example, IPMI power cycle can help or not. And if it didn't help, we just say, okay, this node is like definitely broken. Someone has to take a look at it. Uh, so this is how we do it. And yeah, I wanted to mention validation because we always say, yeah, all right, unit tests, etc. but we never say you have to also run them. So yeah, you should also run them, definitely, because sometimes uh, our call was remediating the node and it says remediation was successful, but the validation says otherwise. So even simple sanity check is something you should do. Check if there are all the GPUs that you expect on the host before returning into the production. And yeah, some gotchas. So, we implemented all of this, it was pretty nice for some time, and then we've seen like, okay, but one given node is being remediated every 30 minutes, like for a week, and it, maybe it's not a perfect solution because it's, it's still not able to operate any, uh, our uh, operating customer workload, yeah? So we did some quick fix, we created an alert, uh, as you can see, we use a uh, node health check operator, uh, Prometheus metrics, and we just say, okay, if this node was being remediated more than uh, two times uh, in 90 minutes interval, uh, we should alert or like, for example, just stop remediating this node. Of course, we have more than just this one alert specified in different interval, but I just wanted to show you the example of it. 
and yeah, the summary. So yeah, we just did some summary with Ryan uh, this week, and it seems like we are doing uh, like on average about 19 remediation per day per 1,000 nodes. So in our scale, it's a lot. It's like almost 1,000 remediations per day. And what's the best about that is that our developers are not being paged anymore about that. And we are just fixing those nodes or remediating the nodes automatically. And our developers can do anything. Like anything is better than just fixing the node, going through round books, etc. Uh, yeah, right now I will hand over to Ryan. Okay, so um, the, the work we talked about here, the, the Notify Maintenance API, we've actually open sourced it. Um, it's under the project on the left with that QR code. It's called Pika. Um, you can check it out. Um, if you're curious, you want to try it. Um, uh, like I said, you, it's, it's, it's a state machine. It's a, it's, a, it's a way to, it has a bunch of canonical states for defining maintenance. So you can use it to build a bunch of controllers like we described around it so that you can do maintenance in a similar way. Um, so, but you know, what's next? Like, uh, we open source this. Um, you know, we really want to collaborate more with the community. Um, you know, that was kind of one of our requirements with this. And um, I kind of I left this as a question, but you know, st start a working group. I, I mean, I think like if there's a lot of interest in the, about this in the community, um, I would love to start a working group and start discussing this topic. And I think it would be interesting and really cross-cutting ac uh, across a bunch of SIGs and working groups. I mean, you look at like the number of accelerators we're putting in our data centers today, and we're really just increasing the entropy of our data centers. And this is just leading to more challenges and, and challenges with doing maintenance and, and even like figuring out like what's going on with some of the problems. Um, and so th that's that kind of thing, um, really leads us to like look at um, different solutions where we need to, we have our devices and we need to, f you know, we need to report them up to Kubernetes. Like all that kind of stuff is, is really important, um, detecting issues so that we can even do something with them. Um, so all that stuff is, um, is really interesting to us. Like we, we want to keep our capacity online, right? It's so expensive, all these different accelerators. We want to make sure they're in use all the time as much as possible. Um, and so one of the resources, um, there is a cap for this um, that is in the community for node maintenance. Um, and it's something that we're interested in, in and uh, we'll be participating in. So it's, I think um, there is some interest out there, but if you are really interested in talking about node maintenance, you know, come find us. We definitely are interested in, in continuing to talk about this more. Okay, and, and that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, did it, oh do you, if, you have, if you have any questions, just step up to the mic and ask away. We've got two minutes. Hey, how's it going? Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, does your maintenance controller take into account multiple node drains? Do, do you have logic, or are you thinking about putting logic in? It seems like the number, the quantity of nodes you have, you probably need to do more than one at a time. Yeah, so that's a great question. So that's really important because we have to take that into account because we want to keep capacity online. One of our requirements is we don't want to interrupt end users. So that also means that we're going to be getting new workloads constantly. So that's our assumption. So we can't just take capacity down forever. So we need to be careful to look at what is going on in the cluster, how many nodes are unschedulable, how many are un under maintenance, how many are under unplanned maintenance, right, or broken or remediated, right? So we. That's something that we built into uh, our controller to, to figure out the right thing to do, to, uh, whether it's the right time to do maintenance. Cool, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, quick question. Uh, for planned, for planned uh, okay. maintenance. We can't hear you. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. That's better. For planned uh, maintenance, uh, how do you guys uh, communicate that with the customers? And if, if there is a workload running, uh, do you just uh, replace it? Uh, restart it from beginning, or is there any uh, protocol to uh, checkpoint and restart from the uh, same point on the new machine? Um, okay, so your question is, um, if we were to interrupt a workload, do, do we have like a checkpoint so that we could return to where it was if we were to bring it back online? Um, so right now with, um, with the GeForce Now workloads, we, we don't, um, we don't really checkpoint them. Um, doesn't mean like we can't do that. We actually, you, you, we could. Um, I, I don't know if we had, we've had too much of a use case for it. Um, but it, the, the thing that I, I would say 
that's important um, about your question is like if we were to take on like AI workloads, for example, that'd be like a really important thing to do. Like we really, when we're going to load large language models into onto a node, like it's really important that we just you know we can checkpoint them and you know return to where they were. So it's something that um, we could do. It's something we could just have to incorporate into you know how we handle maintenance. Yeah, I think that notify maintenance object can be also used by tenants to actively watch for ongoing maintenances on the node. We can also like fan out those to the tenant. It's up up to how you define your API with your tenants, yeah? And which object can they watch and if they even have like Kubernetes access to the node, yeah, like the Kubernetes API one. Thanks. Hi, I have a question. Uh, <coughs> Uh, what is the primary uh, motivation to use CRDs as part of the uh, state to basically, that's how you operate and uh, for the state transitions, right? So um, have you ever explored other options like uh, using a centralized uh, or distributed database or uh, maybe annotations on the node? So um, kind of curious uh, the decision behind, the, behind that. Uh, so I, I missed some of the question. Was it that, w what was the decision to use CRDs? Is that what you said? Right, yeah. Okay. Um, so the the reason was because we wanted to, we really wanted a Kubernetes native solution. I, that was really important to us. And we also wanted to, and this is a common pattern in Kubernetes, right? Like we can define a state machine and expose it behind um, a custom resource definition. Um, so we wanted to, we really just wanted to follow the same pattern and, and besides the, you know, there's such a rich ecosystem in Kubernetes for controllers and, and, and ListWatch. And, and so we really wanted to leverage all of that as in our ecosystem for um, implementing this. So like, all, like I showed those orange boxes on the screen, those are all controllers, those are our native operators in Kubernetes. So we get all that logic of, of essentially ListWatch and, and, and events for free. Um, we get that through the API server and NCD. So it really solved a bunch of problems for us. We didn't have to worry about a lot of those things, so it made it easier for us to, to get started and make it effective. Thank you. Can you hear me? Hello? Yep. So can you guys speak a bit to how you guys are actually making workload-aware decisions on when you should approve maintenance, right? You're like approving maintenance, on, I'm assuming, on behalf of workloads. Um, can you speak a bit to like what kind of intelligence you guys are using? Is it just PDB? Are you doing some like actual checks with the workloads? Like I know you're actually informing, you said you'd actually inform the workloads or fan out the, the message. Can you speak a bit more to this? Yeah, um, so we, this is something that's like kind of ongoing. We've, because um, it's, it's like a really large topic. Um, we, we're actually kind of learning along the way as we're doing this. Um, we've, now that we've gotten to a point where we can do maintenance is in data centers. So. Um, a lot of what we're looking at doing now is like when I give the example of scheduling maintenance at the fleet level, is we have all these regional data centers, right? And you can imagine that um, that, and maybe this is for many out here, like there's certain seasonality patterns to your usage, and so there's this is just one example where we could look at the seasonality data and we could say, okay, well, data center in Florida right now is under low usage. So it's like really good time to do maintenance there. Whereas in LAX, the, it's under high usage. So we really shouldn't take the opportunity to do maintenance. We could, but you know, it might be a little slower. So there's these, all these things we can do. We can choose, pick and choose on all these different factors. We can go by incidents, active incidents, regional incidents. Um, you know, those are all the kind of things that we've we found and we're learning and that we, um, we're gonna be incorporating. So you're not necessarily looking into like what the workloads are doing. Like so it's workload agnostic at this point. So we also do like some of our tenants has its own controllers. Where it's not like using uh, I don't know replica set or something like this. That's why we also have SLA and our tenant controllers are watching the notify maintenance objects and they know that they have to evacuate their workload in this amount of time. I see. Thank you. Okay, I think we're at time. Thank you very much.